this out. All right. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Conversations with Rob. Please listen to us uh, on here and also on the radio. We are on quite a few stations now. Uh, if you uh, like this interview, please like and subscribe this YouTube interview, but also the other interviews that we do. We interview a lot of interesting people with a lot of interesting stories to tell uh, that they've done in, in their life. So uh, look into that. So everybody have a special guest. This is Michael J. Young. He is a medical doctor. We're going to be talking about healthcare issues, which is a big topic in uh, politics right now and in people's lives in general. So Mr. Young, first of all, thanks for coming on the show. We greatly appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right, and I'm sure the guests will look forward to hearing your opinion on all these sorts of medical health care issues, because like I said, there's a lot going on in that sort of realm right now in uh, political life. But first, before we get into all the health care stuff, tell us about, a little bit about you, where you uh, grew up, and why you wanted to become a medical doctor. I grew up in Indiana, uh, one of the flyover states. A Hoosier. Uh, a Hoosier, that's correct. And... Uh, <laughs> I am uh, the youngest of, of four kids in my family, and both my older brothers are physicians as well. My father was a physician, and actually I'm fourth generation uh, in the medical field as a uh, physician, and it was what I wanted to be. It's uh, what I wanted to do. Uh, it's the dining room dinner conversation that I heard that I wanted to take part in. So, yeah, so I, I grew up in Indiana. I went to my... Uh, to Indiana University for my undergraduate work, and then I went to Chicago uh, at Rush University uh, for medical school, and then spent another six years in uh, residency in the field of urology. Right. I practiced urology for nearly 30 years, and about two and a half years ago, I decided to step out of clinical practice. I had uh, had enough frustration with where medicine was going that I wanted to write about it, which I did in my first book, The Illness of Medicine, and also with an interest in innovation and uh, patenting devices. I uh, now am uh, on the faculty at the University of Illinois in Chicago designing surgical instruments and teaching uh, medical students and undergraduates in engineering. Right. So let's get into the thick of things as far as uh, medical issues go. Uh, uh, like we said at the beginning in the interview, we hear a lot about uh, uh, health care issues in the politics right now. Uh, so what do you feel, as being somebody that's worked in the medical field, the big problems with um, you know, health care is right now? We hear about cost all the time. But we look at medical doctors, and you can correct me if I'm wrong because obviously I'm not one, uh, with as far as a medical doctor, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you have to worry about. You have to worry about liability. You have to worry about uh, that, which is a big thing with doctors. Uh, people uh, have issues with that all the time. So, but what are the big issues as far as a uh, doctor that you see as far in uh, healthcare? Well, you know the the expression that the answer is money. Now, ask me the question, <laughs> and I would. I would argue that the problem in healthcare is money. Uh, it's the fact that healthcare has become entrenched in business. It is no longer or is losing the perspective of taking care of ill, relieving suffering. It has become a commodity. And that commodity, uh, that which is being traded and bartered is our health currency. Um, our health care is becoming something that is exchanged and it, it is being made, made into a profit. And I have nothing wrong with a society or a system that is making profit. Uh, that is how America in a, our capitalistic uh, environment works. But the problem is that this has become profiteering. It has become uh, a, a, a method of 
of taking advantage. It is a process by which you and I as patients have very little, if any, control. Right. Uh, I don't know of anything that I buy in life that I don't have some control over it. Whereas in healthcare, I purchase a premium and I am really uh, lacking any ability to understand really what I have purchased. I, the, the insurance industry is opaque. Uh, the processes I have to go through are, are unclear. And so I, as a patient, are purchasing something I have to have, yet have very little ability to manage myself or control. So I think the problem, Robert, is that um, the, the, the money in medicine, the, the business of medicine has taken over health care. Uh, you becoming ill or you getting sick uh, can destroy your life. Uh, in ways that it never could. We see this is the largest reason for uh, patients going bankrupt is healthcare costs. That shouldn't be. So I think, uh, and part of the reason I became so frustrated as a physician was practicing in this environment where as a physician, I am controlled, I am dictated. My practice and perhaps 40% of practices in the country are controlled or owned by a corporate structure. They're dictating how one should practice. I don't think that's the way it ought to be. So that's why I stepped out and wanted to spend time talking about it and writing about it. Right, and I 100% agree with everything you said. I, you know, we hear stories all the time on the news. Uh, it might not be on the mainstream media, but we, you know, you look online, you, you hear these stories. Uh, there was a guy in New York, his son uh, didn't pay a $20 uh, bill from a, uh, on his on his premium, uh, I don't I don't know the correct terminology, but it was yeah, it was just a twenty dollar bill that he didn't pay, and uh, all of a sudden he uh, didn't get the uh, they cut his insurance. He had some very serious mental health issues. He wasn't able to get his medication because he missed that twenty dollars. Long story, he got he was got is going through a divorce. The mail went to his uh, his uh, wife's house or his ex wife at the time. And he didn't receive it, and she threw it away. So the the the, the bill, uh, you know, they canceled his premium, and uh, he wasn't able to get the medicine. He drove off a bridge. He killed himself. So, and we're hearing all these stories. Insulin. People are paying double than other countries in the world. We're seeing people uh, commit suicide, like I said in that uh, case, by all over the country because they can't afford to pay medical bills. And this is what, you know, I want to ask you too, and this goes into the next question. We see a lot of people going for, to the emergency room for simple things for, you know, a cold or something like that. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's out of control. Like, my thing is, why don't these people understand? I feel like there's a lot of medical doctors that are stepping up, going to Washington, saying what the real story is, but our politicians uh, sold out to the corporate interest to the money and they will not make any changes for the good of the people. Do you agree with that statement or am I you know, going overboard no, I, with that? No, I don't think you are. First of all, in addressing the, the emergency room issue, um, people can't afford to take time off of work to go to a physician's uh, office. They can't wait uh, the, the time it takes to get an appointment. So they will go when they can, and that's why patients end up going to the ERs, and typically more often than not, it's in the evening hours, and everybody has the same plan, and therefore the lines are for hours. Uh, the emergency room also tends to be the most costly way to take care of a problem. Uh, and as you mentioned, you talked about uh, the diabetes, you talked about insulin. Um, sure, if a patient could go to a physician, say, quarterly, every several months, their blood sugar levels would be much better monitored. They would not have these crises that end up causing them to go in via an ambulance to the ER, now being hospitalized for X number of days until this catastrophic event can be controlled again, if they only had an appointment. But people can't afford the premiums. They can't can't afford the time and they can't afford just the upfront costs of co-pays and deductibles to go to their physician. So then you ask the question, why is that? And yes, you are 100% correct. I think 
as you stated, Robert, that the industry uh, that is controlling the purse strings, it, let's take, for instance, the insurance industry, they are, they are not the ones who are uh, best equipped to take care of the patient. They're the ones who are ha handling the money. And so they are dictating the costs uh, that a patient has to pay. They're dictating what a physician receives. And I think it's a very, uh, very uh, opaque problem. And one that, for instance, if you were to call just simply a car dealership and ask what's the price of a Chevy Volt, you would get the price of that car right there. You can go online and you can find it. Right. If you call a hospital and ask them, what will it cost to get this hernia repaired? What will it cost to get this knee replaced or this cataract done? They're not going to give you an answer. What they're going to do is give you a question. And the question they're going to ask you is, what's your insurance? Because the price is predicated upon what insurance you have. So how can we have a, a, a system that is working equitably if the person who owns that insurance doesn't even know the value of their insurance? So leading to your next point, this has become politicized. Yes, it has. And it's unfortunate. And I think if we try to eliminate the political terms and simply look at the problems and solutions, we will do a much better job. People have politicized uh, certain terms as socialized medicine. Right. Well, the VA system is a socialized medicine system, 100% socialized. And the definition of socialized medicine, if you will, is that the government uh, pays uh, the hospital, they own the physicians, and they are the ones that are funding it. So they have the, uh, the providers, they have the buildings, and they are funding it. That is purely socialized. And yet, if you ask veterans, probably 95% would say, I want to keep it. Yet, in the political arena, we call this socialized. And all of a sudden, all sorts of red flags go up. So let's get rid of the terms and stick with the problem. So as I said earlier, I think the issue is the money in medicine. If we get rid of the money, if we make it a level playing field, then I think we would eliminate this profiteering that is occurring, whether you're seeing it in the insurance industry, the device manufacturers, the pharmaceutical industry, on and on and on, the layers of profiteering that's occurring. Uh, so personally, I feel we need a, a system based upon that, uh, where we do have a single payer system and we would eliminate that privatization. Then people get upset with the fact that we don't have the opportunity to have private health insurance, um, which I say, fine, let's keep the private sector for patients who wish to have that. This is America. If I wish to drive a Lexus and you wish to drive a Yugo, that's your privilege to drive it as it is mine if I can afford it. So I think we should all have a baseline single payer system. And if I, as an individual of particular wealth or ability, want to pay somebody additionally to take care of me, that should be my right as well. So I don't want to see elimination of private health care, uh, which is what I believe is Senator Sanders' opinion. Right. He wants everything socialized. I think we need a baseline single-payer system. And if you want to add to that or in adjunction to that, have something else, fine. Right. But well, we have to get rid of the money. Sorry to interrupt you, Doc. Uh, for, for a question, Doc, uh, I know you said what the Senate's plan. Um, the question is, though, if we do have what you were saying, what you're saying as far as single payer with like a public option, or we have single payer with the private insurance, if people stay with the private insurance, that money is going to go out of Medicare for all, which the Senate is proposing, which is going to hurt Medicare for all for the, well, everybody because they're not going to get all that funding, which as you said, as you said, if it was everybody together, all the funding goes in there. Um, so my question is, if you do go your way, what's going to happen with that money that's not being funded into the system? Because we've seen this in different states as far as Vermont. They had a Medicare for all system, but obviously they still had uh, private. 
and people were skeptical, as you said, about the socialization, people saying those code words, and it ended up failing because there wasn't enough money in that system. So what do you say to somebody like me that's worried about if we don't go fully to Medicare for all, we're not going to have a, enough money to you know, really keep that system going for years to come? And I think the same thing can be applied to, say, vaccinations. If you don't vaccinate the herd, right, yeah. you're going to have some outliers that will continue to cause the infection. Right. What I do think, and as much as I uh, disagree with uh, his, uh, all of, of what uh, Senator Sanders said, uh, what does make sense to me is that his theory of doing this is ramped up. It's not done overnight. Oh, I think yeah. we dip our toe in. He wants yeah. to start, and it's not that I'm voting for Senator Sanders, it's just that he's been very outspoken about this process, perhaps as much if not more than anyone. But he feels that yes, Medicare started at age 65 for the next four or five years, then we reduce it down to 55 over the next five years, and then 45. This is gonna be a process, Robert. This is not going to happen overnight. And I would make the same argument about the Affordable Care Act. It was a starting point, not a finished line. And everybody expected it to have all of the answers immediately. And it, obviously it did not for a number of reasons. It was implemented poorly. Uh, obviously a lot of, uh, of more elderly were in, engaged in it than younger people who have fewer health problems. And so it couldn't continue to finance itself, which is why, again, as you stated, we need everybody in it. But I do think it has to have a ramp on period. We just can't throw everybody into the deep end at one time. Yeah, that's uh, fair enough. Is it going to be perfect? No, it's not. But if you look at other companies, uh, other, pardon me, other countries, European countries, for instance, right. they have a much lower uh, a problem of this. The, the uh, more of the money is going to healthcare in general. And so you don't have these crises, uh, ups and downs that we see uh, that we would potentially have if we jumped all in at one time. It has to be a process. And I think people have to be aware of that and take the time to allow this to, to grab root rather than all or nothing and then in four years we throw it out. Right. No, we have a lot of uh, Bernie Sanders support is on here, so I'm sure they'll appreciate you uh, going through that plan uh, in depth. Um, but I do want to talk about uh, what you said. You said about the health care and stuff with uh, other countries and stuff. It's not going to be perfect. I agree with you. And we do see that. Uh, but you know what? Our system is, is not even close to being perfect now. I mean, it's a train wreck. It's a disaster. As we talked about people committing suicide. Uh, people, senior citizens are cutting pills in half, insulin issue. We've talked about mental health too, uh, that people can't afford to get mental health issues. And then we see uh, schools being shot up because, you know, you know, stuff is not being caught. Yes, of course, but these people are not afford to pay like two or $300 to see somebody that they may need to talk to that may be able to help them. But my question is now about Obamacare. We talked a little bit, rather you talked about that a little bit in the last answer. Do you believe Obamacare, I know you said it wasn't, it was a step, it wasn't a, you know, like Medicare for all would be. But as far as Obamacare, I feel like it was a giveaway to the insurance companies as far as um, costs goes. There was no cost structure in Obamacare, which meant Prices would just, you know, they would start at one spot and they just keep going up and up. And I feel like that was one of the big reasons why Obamacare has kind of failed a little bit. I, I like what President Obama did because I am on Obamacare and it did save me a heck of a lot of money. I was at, paying $300 a month when I went on to Obamacare, it was 130 So uh, it, it was a big change for me and a lot of cost savings as yeah. far as cost goes. I saw, I saw patients, Robert, who, uh, these were 24, 25 year old kids. I shouldn't say kids, adults, but they were still under their parents' plan and they couldn't have had health care insurance. I saw, I remember one patient I saw, uh, he was uh, an actor and to be a successful actor may take uh, years if ever yeah. to, to occur. And he was plagued by kidney stones and, um, he told me after I took care of him, he said, this is the first time 
that I didn't go through weeks and weeks of pain uh, because it was managed appropriately and quickly. Um, yes, I, I do agree that Obamacare was, was poorly orchestrated in the sense that it, it did give the insurance company a gift. Right. Suddenly, everybody was going to be under that blanket. Right. Um, it also afforded people with pre-existing conditions care. It also expanded Medicaid. It gave patients the opportunity to evaluate through the open market system to actually see what they're getting. It had many positive things, but poorly it was implemented. It was something that I think people wanted it to work so badly uh, that unfortunately that the moment there was evidence of failure, everyone just wanted to move on much too quickly. Uh, and again, it became a political decision as opposed to what is the right decision to do for us. And if you look at, you look at the United States, as you mentioned, yes, we have the best technology in the world, the best innovation in the world, and yet we have the worst access in the world. We have the uh, most cumbersome, inefficient, uh, administrative problems related to obtaining health care. Uh, so what we're doing, if we stay on this trajectory, it will, it will be an abomination. It will fall apart. It is not sustainable. Simply, financially, it's not sustainable. Uh, I think the uh, issues that you raised in terms of the elderly, which our country is getting older, yeah. and the chronic diseases of age are going to be more costly. And we have to make a change. I, I don't think it's a debate. Right. I 100% agree with you. Um, so the last thing on uh, uh, Medicare for All and Obamacare and that aspect of the interview before we get to some other questions. As far as Medicare for All goes, I mean, we've seen the popularity of those, that type of issue uh, go up in the polls, 60 to 70% uh, in general, 80% of Democrats, uh, even 50% of Republicans uh, for that type of system. Uh, do you feel like, uh, you know, you know, you're not a, um, you know, a psychic or anything, but do you, but do you feel like this is, will pass within the next maybe 10 years uh, as far as in our country, as yes. far as you, 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 you think so then? Even with the kind of money yeah. behind I, it, I, against it rather? I do. I think that, sense and sensibility is eventually going to take over mm -hmm. uh, because what is going on now is unsustainable. And I do think uh, what this will require is, is, is acceptance of our situation. And I am hopeful, I, I, again, I have to say hopeful that the political environment will once again gain some common sense and stop with the terminology which is useless and meaningless and is not productive. But I do think ultimately people are going to come around. We have no choice because we can't stay on this road that we're on. And I do believe that the younger people realize this. I think that the, the X gen, the Z gen, the millennials, they are starting to become much more uh, aware and abreast of these situations that the many of the older patients simply didn't want to change. Don't take my Medicare. No, we're trying to add people to the Medicare. Right. So, it, it, you know, it's like many things. I think we have to go through these gyrations and evaluations, but I don't think we have a choice, Robert, but to have this work in a, in a manner that is consistent for coverage of everybody. I, I agree, Doc. Uh, so I want to move on to uh, medical uh, issues. Uh, so as far as like when you were practicing, uh, and we see a lot of this on TV because a lot of there's a lot of health consciousness we've seen in the Affordable Care Act. If you go to a fast food place or even a regular restaurant, they're supposed to, uh, the majority of them have the calorie count or the fat count now on the menu. Uh, so when you were practicing, did you see uh, a lot of, uh, or do you feel rather a lot of people with illnesses that um, as far as health wise 
or a lot of it because what we're eating, what's in our food. We see antibiotics, high fructose corn syrup, sodium, uh, sugar, yeah. all in everything. Uh, so I feel like obviously genetics plays a part in illnesses, but as far as that, what do you feel uh, as far as, you know, all this crap in plain English, well, what's in our food? Well, we're seeing more and more cancer than I can ever recall. And if you think about your day, you know, from the time you wake up, you wake up, you step in the shower and you wash your hair with this green stuff and then you put this white stuff in it and then you shave with this blue stuff and then you brush your teeth with this green stuff with sparkles and then you put deodorant on then you put cologne on, blah, 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 blah. And I do feel that we are environmentally affecting ourselves, not just what we're ingesting. That's just the start of your day. I've just talked about the first 20 minutes of your morning. Right. Now let's talk about the food you're eating, the dry cleaning of your clothes, et cetera, et cetera. So I would agree that yes, we are contributing to our own health issues. Uh, we look at the diet, you look at the American diet, uh, you walk down the street and you realize that obesity is, is no longer the exception. It's becoming the rule. Uh, people don't want to exercise. They don't want to walk. Uh, you know, we are the end result of all of these things. Right. So how do we cure this? I mean, how do we even like, you know, you look at the label of anything, whether it's cereal to, uh, you know, any kind of frozen food is all kinds of big words that you can't even pronounce. And if you look online, there's a lot of gibberish on it about there uh, online. So how do we even like go about like making sure we eat the right foods? I mean, yes, well, I know fresh foods is, but if you're a poor low income person, you can't afford to buy fresh food all the time. You don't have that kind of money if you're making eight or nine bucks an hour. So I mean, how do we even go about cycle. this? Right. It's a vicious cycle. You can't afford what you, the quality and therefore you end up with the garbage. But I would, I would make the statement that it all begins with education, period. Look at where we are in our country today. This is the end result, I would say, of 20, 30, 40 years of the dumbing of America. Uh, people don't read a book, they watch television. Not that television is bad, but if you're doing it without information that you can get by your own synthesis of your own interpretation rather than somebody spewing it to you yes. you're going to do what you hear um i think it all starts with education robert and um uh but we also have become a very lazy entitled society uh, i'm not saying everybody has to has to go out and exercise uh, but they sure have to get off their duff and start doing something rather than sitting there and eating uh, sugar all day. Uh, we need to sleep better. We need to relax better. This is the problem of America. We are so wound up. We are like a spring right now. People don't know how to relax. They don't know when to vacation. Uh, they don't exercise. They don't eat properly. They don't sleep properly. Right. So all of these in combination, I would argue, are creating a, a fair amount of our health problems. When I was in practice, because again, just two and a half years ago, um, I would see a number of patients coming in for erectile dysfunction. <laughs> okay, that's typical for a urologist. Yeah. But the reality is, is that is a symptom as a result of many other things. Again, eating, sleeping, stop the smoking, stop the cut down on the alcohol. Uh, you know, we don't need a pill for that. Right. But if the thing is, Robert, I can't sell exercise very well on television. I can't sell sleep very well on television, nor can I sell a healthy lifestyle. What I can sell on television is a pill. Right. And we are more interested in selling disease in this country than we are in selling preventative health care because there's no money in preventative health care. And if you go to other countries, you will see their advertisements are different than ours. We have 700,000 ads a year on television in the United States advocating some drug or remedy. Not one is talking about how to get better. It's all about what we can do for you. 
I hear a lot of things, and I have, I have two more questions left. I, have, I hear a lot of things of, uh, you know, doing research and stuff for this interview and to other people saying a lot of these commercials on TV, the money was supposed to go into research and development, but a lot of the money is going into the commercials on TV for whether it's erectile dysfunction or some sort of other pill for another thing. So, I mean, do you, do you agree with that? Or do you hear the same things that a lot of this money that was supposed to go in research and development is just going to TV ads to sell the pills? No, no it wasn't supposed to go into R&D. Uh, the R&D budgets are typically two to four times less than the advertising wow. budgets. It's wow. budgeted for this. It, it, it just didn't happen. You have an industry uh, that is, you know, making a trillion dollars a year of yeah. which the U.S., which is 5% of the world's population, consumes 40% of the world's drugs. We are being bombarded. The industry is spending roughly five to seven billion dollars a year in advertising to patients and some 24 billion dollars to physicians but that is roughly three times the r d budget so no it's not that it could have gone to r d it is assigned from the get-go to go into advertisement if you look at the statistics of drugs that are advertised uh and again my specialty being urology, I'm more versed on these issues. A number of years ago, if you remember, there was a, a large uh, boost for testosterone sales. Yeah. And it was being advertised. They, they even marketed it as low T, if you recall. Yeah. Yeah. Suddenly they gave a, a, a name, uh, an acronym to this condition. Uh, only 5% of men uh, who have the condition is due to low testosterone. But it was shown that if you market this, they had 10 times the sales in those marketed areas. So by promoting the advertising, they promoted the sales of the drug. It's but simple. Do you feel like, uh, and this is my last question, and I know this is kind of, in a way, um, is what, with what you have done in medicine. We see a lot of pornography now. A lot of these guys think that, uh, you know, with the you talk about the erectile dysfunction and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of talk has been done, you know, that I've heard about, and you can correct me if I'm, is a lot of people are uh, masturbating, they're watching this pornography, they're, uh, as far as you said, drinking and doing drugs and stuff like that. And a lot of that is, you know, gets to low self-esteem, and a lot of that goes to erectile dis um, dysfunction. Does pornography really do that as far as erectile dysfunction and well, stuff like no, that? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think that's, that's getting the, into it. It gets into a circular argument of the chicken and the egg. Okay. Um, the accessibility of it has certainly increased. Right. Uh, but I don't think that has caused a, a medical condition. Uh, now, I think perhaps the attention to that porn is that due to loneliness or is that due to other social factors? Perhaps, but I don't think that induces a physiological change of that, that one can make directly. I was curious because I've, I've It's a complex that. circle of questions, but I, I really don't think that um, erectile dysfunction itself can be uh, blamed or as a result of the change in our social habits. I think it is really a consequence of our lifestyle, unless you want to broaden that and include that in that answer. Sure. All right. No, that's fair. All right, Doc, and that's the last question. Where can people find more about you? And also, I'd love to have you on again as the healthcare debate um, you sure. know, heats up even more. Sure. Well, I listen, I appreciate the opportunity. I have a website. It is michaeljyoungmd.com. And at that website, uh, I do have uh, some discussion of my opinions on things and certainly uh, access to both of my books. One is The Illness of Medicine, uh, which is describing much of what we talked about. The other book is a, is a fictional story uh, called Consequence of Murder. It has to do with research that I was doing um, following uh, practice. Um, but michaeljmd.com uh, or certainly my books are available on Amazon or at gmbooks.com, uh, my publisher's website. All right, Doc, and I will send you this interview after, but I appreciate your time. 
And thanks so much. We'll definitely try to get you back on again. Absolutely. I would, I really enjoyed this. Wonderful. Robert, thank you so much. Thanks, Take Doc. Care. Bye My now. My pleasure. Bye-bye.